The first speaker is Armen Sergeyev from Steklov Institute. Uh, he will speak about from Ginsburg-Landau vortices to Zyberkwitten equations. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to, uh, to thank the organizers and especially Alexander Van Chaptekarev for uh, invitation and possibility to give a talk here. My talk will be devoted to uh, some problem in uh, theoretical physics, which uh, turned out uh, to be uh, very closely related to complex analysis. And moreover, it has uh, uh, several generalization, in particular to dimension four, which will be fi the final part of my talk. So uh, uh, it is well known that uh, some metals under the temperatures close to absolute zero behave like superconductors. That means that electric current can travel along them without resistance. According to modern theory of superconductivity, it is due to the fact that free electrons under such low temperatures, close to absolute zero, uh, unite with each other, forming the so-called Cooper pairs, which are the quasi-particles uh, with double electric charge and zero spin. But there are also other spin. Uh, it may have also different spin, but I will uh, restrict to this case. So in contrast with fermionic electrons, free particles, uh, uh, those particles are bosons. And precisely, they are flow is responsible for the superconductivity, because they do not interact with the, uh, with the uh, free electrons. So suppose uh, now that we have a superconductor in the exterior magnetic field H. So I will uh, uh, draw it uh, like a cube just to underline its uh, three-dimensionality. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, the superconductor is, uh, is a cube. And there is an exterior magnetic field, H. Uh, then, uh, according to Meissner effect, uh, by the way, all names which I, I will call here are all Nobel Prizes. Uh, every, every name is a Nobel Prize. So according to Meissner effect, this magnetic field is pushed away from the superconductors. So that H, uh, magnetic field, vanishes inside the superconductor. This is one of the criteria of superconductivity. If we increase the field H, then after some critical value of H, the superconductivity will break down and magnetic field begin to penetrate inside the superconductor. At this stage, the body of superconductor is pierced through the, uh, by the tube zones uh, of mixed conductivity, parallel to the direction of magnetic flow, which are called the flux tubes. So what we have uh, here, we have some uh, tube-like zones, which are called, as I said, uh, the flux tubes. Uh, and they go parallel to the direction of magnetic field. In the center of these uh, tubes, uh, there are uh, lines in the center, which, I called, uh, which are called uh, Abrikosov strings. So uh, what, we, what we have here, uh, along these Abrikosov strings, the conductivity is already normal. Outside the flux tubes, it's still superconductivity. And uh, in, inside the tubes, but away from the uh, precursor strings, it's of mixed character. Both phases are present, the, pres the uh, normal phase and the superconducting phase. Uh, so that I have already uh, said this. Uh, so I can switch to another. If we continue uh, to increase the level of magnetic field uh, further on, the uh, number of flux tubes and their diameters will also increase until they fill up the whole superconductor, converting it into a normal conductor. That's how the uh, breaking of the superconductivity goes on. Now, uh, mathematically, the mixed state of superconductor formed in flux tubes may be described by the Ginsburg-Landau-Lagrangian. Uh, in order to write it down, consider the following idealized physical model. First of all, suppose that the, the superconductor coincides with the whole space R3 with coordinates x1, x2, and x3. And so that the external magnetic field H is parallel to the x3 axis as, as here. Uh, we shall assume 
uh, data conductivity inside these superconductors is everywhere of mixed character. Everywhere outside abricots of strings, of course, because along abricots of strings it's normal, conductivity is normal. Now we take, uh, uh, we take the, uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, just to uh, write down the Gisburg Landau Lagrangian, we take here uh, the plane R2 with coordinates x1, x2 which is orthogonal to the direction of a magnetic field. Uh, and then uh, the Ginsburg-Landau uh, uh, Lagrangian defined on this plane will, will have the following form. Uh, I should keep it here. So a, a phi is equal to modulus of a squared plus modulus d a phi squared plus lambda over 4, 1 minus modulus phi squared and uh, now I will explain uh, uh, the meaning of the variables. Uh, there are two variables here. This is a and phi. And uh, I will explain the all terms of this Lagrangian. All, all of them have uh, non-trivial uh, um, uh, physical meaning. So first of all, what is a? That is one of the variables here. <coughs> a represents electromagnetic vector potential, or more or less standard uh, thing in, in theoretical physics. Well, mathematically, what is this? Uh, it is a U1 connection on this uh, plane, R1, with coordinates x1, x2, which is just given by one form. So you can say that this is just one form where A1, A2 are smooth uh, coefficients where are pure imaginary. The curvature of this connection is given by the two form FA, which is just an exterior derivative of this form A. So it's written in a standard way, like fij dx y dx j, uh, where coefficients are written in a usual way, like uh, exterior derivative, di aj minus dj ai, uh, where dj is just derivative with respect to xj. And physically, the, as I said, this is interpreted as electromagnetic field, uh, while the term modulus fa squared, this is the fir first term here, uh, is identified with Maxwell Lagrangian. So this is more or less standard, standard term. Uh, the next variable, phi, this is phi here, standing. The variable phi is what is called the Higgs field. Uh, mathematically, it's very simple. This is just a smooth complex valued function, phi, which is equals to phi 1 plus i phi 2. Of course, these are real valued, uh, as you can uh, imagine. And <coughs> from the physical point of view, it describes scalar field, scalar field which interacts with electromagnetic field A. And it is interpreted as the wave function of Cooper pairs. These pairs which is uh, responsible for the superconducting uh, current. Uh, the covariant exterior derivative, which is standing here, uh, in the second term of this landau lagrangian is given again by the standard formula. This is the phi plus A phi. A is the one form, as you remember. So it can be written like that, where a i is a coefficient of this a. And this term, modulus d a phi squared, is also more or less standard in theoretical physics. Uh, uh, it describes, it is responsible for the interaction of electromagnetic field a, uh, or f, uh, f, with a Higgs field phi. Uh, so this uh, first two terms are more or less standard for uh, theoretical physicists. But the last term, this is the main term, the last term. Uh, lambda over 4, 1 minus modulus phi squared, squared, where parameter lambda is positive. Uh, as I said, this is the most important gradient. And uh, this term is responsible uh, what physicists called, uh, for the nonlinear character of what physicists called self-interaction of the field phi. So this, is, uh, this term was introduced by Ginsburg to Landau. Uh, we require uh, that modulus phi tends to 1 when uh, x approaches infinity, which means physically that the pure su superconductivity persists at infinity. Everywhere it's mixed character, but at infinity we, we, we still have pure superconductivity. Uh, the zeros of this function, so you, uh, this function phi will play a very important role. So let's write it in uh, uh, polar form, rho e to the power i theta, and uh, the zeros of this function uh, you, you, can, you can look here. 
what are the zeros? Uh, from this uh, abricots of strings, we have only these points. And these points are zeros of phi. So for us, now we can forget about these flux tubes and uh, abricots of uh, strings, and we can uh, only remember about this phi. So uh, the zeros, as I said, uh, they correspond to the intersection points of abricots of strings with the plane R2. And in the neighborhood of such zero, the vector field, we can consider the vector field, which is a gradient of this uh, theta, of this angle, it behaves like hydrodynamical vortex. So the, the picture of this uh, vector field will be something like that. If we have a zero here, then this vector field behaves something like that. Of course, it's, it may, uh, may go around uh, several times. Uh, so it looks like a hydrodynamical uh, vortex. And by this reason, uh, these uh, uh, solutions of the considered model are called Ginsburg-Lagau vortices. Moreover, uh, moreover, I can say that there are non-trivial uh, non uh, uh, connections between this Ginsburg-Lagau vortices, or you can call this uh, quantum liquid. That is, this quantum liquid and the usual liquid. There are very non-trivial uh, 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 relations between them, but I will not, uh, it's a separate talk. It needs a separate talk about it, so I will omit this, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, the last uh, variable here is this lambda. Uh, I recall that this is a positive parameter. And the physical meaning of this, that it is responsible for the interaction of vortices. If a lambda is less than one, they are attracted to each other. Respectively, if lambda is greater than one, they are repelled from each other. Uh, for the critical value lambda equals to one, the vortices do not interact. And we can expect that for this value of lambda, any configuration of vortices that is zero so far may be realized. By this reason, we restrict ourselves to the mathematically interesting case lambda equals to one. For physicists, maybe it's nonsense how you can expect that lambda is equal to one. But this uh, also has some physical meaning. Now I will uh, switch to more mathematical uh, 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 talk. Uh, first of all, let's define the potential energy of our model. This is the integral of this Lagrangian over our two-dimensional uh, plane, uh, d2x. So this is the uh, uh, potential energy of our, uh, of our model. And I recall that I, I have imposed the condition this modulus of phi equals uh, tends to one at infinity. What does it mean? It means that the map phi sends the uh, uh, circles of sufficiently large radius to topological circle, because it's close to one by, by modulus. It means uh, that our problem has a topological invariant, given by the rotation number of the map phi at infinity. This invariant is called the vortex number and takes integer values. You can say this is just algebraic uh, sum of the zeros. Uh, or divisor, if you, if you like. Now we can uh, give mathematical definition of Ginsburg-Landau vortices. They are the pairs, A phi, on which the infinum, uh, minimum of the potential energy, which is supposed to be finite, is realized in a given topological class fixed by the vortex number D. If this vortex number D is positive, then such pairs are called d vortices. And if it is negative, they are called modulus d anti vortices. So, in our uh, problem, there may be vortices and anti vortices. One of the most important features of our model uh, is the uh, invariance of potential energy, UA phi, under the infinite dimensional group of gauge transforms. These gauge transforms are given by the following uh, transformations. We can add to A the differential of some function, chi, and uh, simultaneously we should uh, change the phase of phi by, uh, by this minus, uh, uh, minus uh, i chi. Uh, here chi is an arbitrary smooth real valued function on our plane. So uh, if, you, if, you, if you look here, for example, it's clear that this is not changed. This is not changed because it's just the differential is just the same, and uh, here is only uh, changing the phase. And uh, the, other, the other terms also do not change. That means that from physical point of view, uh, we are not interested in, in, such, in all solutions of our equations, uh, which I still have not written. Uh, 
but we are, we are uh, interested in the, what is called moderate space of divortices. Moderate space is the following. It's all divortices, all solutions of our model. Uh, modular gauge transform. That's the only uh, thing which is interesting from physical point of view. Uh, in fact, the description was given by Taubes. To formulate his result, we introduced the complex coordinate Z on our plane R2, which is X1 plus IX2. And we said, as usual, D bar is this, the usual D over DX1 D plus e, D over DX2. And D bar A is this D bar, this D bar, plus the zero one uh, part of our uh, connection of our form A written in complex coordinates. Now, here comes the equations at last. I will not show how they are obtained. That was another problem. But uh, it, uh, it may be proved that the vortices satisfy the following system of vortex equations. This is one of the main notions. Uh, D bar A phi equals to zero. I F12 equals uh, one over two, one minus modulus phi squared. So you see that the first, uh, the first uh, equation is just covariant D bar equation. So it means that complex analysis is really uh, it's, it's sitting inside this problem. And the second, this is the main equation. This is very non-trivial equation because you, uh, you can understand that this is non-linear with respect to phi. Uh, so it's a non-trivial uh, problem how to describe uh, the modular space of, solu of solutions of this system. Uh, this was uh, solved by Taubes, and I, I, let me uh, formulate his theorem. For any unordered collection, Z1, Zk, of k points on the complex plane C, taken with multiplicities d1, dk, such that their sum is equal to d. Of course, here I, I assume that d is positive. Uh, there exists a unique up to gauge transforms, the vortex A phi, such that phi vanishes precisely in the points z1, zk, with given multiplicities d1, dk. So this uh, uh, problem has a unique solution in, uh, in terms of modular spaces. Uh, and that's uh, why I, I said to, uh, to you that uh, the zeros of phi play an important role. That's, uh, in fact, the main role. Uh, I, will not, uh, I will not say how it is proved. The proof is uh, really not trivial and very technical. But uh, moreover, Taubes has proved that uh, any critical point, A phi, of the functional, of potential energy functional, with vortex number D, is gauge equivalent to some D vortex. This is uh, immediate. Uh, uh, this is uh, the second part of Taub's theorem. In other words, all solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equations for the functional of potential energy with finite energy are stable, and uh, they have minimal energy in their topological classes. So there are no solutions, no settle points, only minima in this problem. Uh, the Taub's theorem implies that the moderate space. It's very easy now to, do, of course, to, uh, to uh, describe the modular space of the vortices. It may be identified with the vector, field, vector space C D, C in power D, by associating with any connection Z1, Zk, the monic polynomial, having the monic means that uh, the uh, first coefficient is one, uh, having its zeros precisely at given point Z1, Zk, with given multiplicities D1, Dk. So, uh, one may think that the problem is solved because uh, we have described the modular space, but it, it gives you nothing because it's just CD. But it will be non-trivial CD, as, as you will see, uh, because it, it will be provided with non-trivial matrix. Without metric, of course, it's just trivial. Topology is trivial, as you see. Uh, the anti-vortices with D uh, negative admit an analogous description. I will not formulate this. Combining both of these results, we can give them the following physical interpretation. Solutions of Euler-Lagrange equations for the poten uh, potential energy functional consist either of vortices or anti-vortices. One, uh, uh, one, our model cannot contain simultaneously both vortices and anti-vortices. Such as physicists say bound states should annihilate before the system is transformed into the static uh, 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 case, a static state. So in our, uh, in our problem, there is no, uh, no uh, solution steep uh, vortex, anti-vortex. Impossible. Now, uh, uh, I, I, I add one more variable. And this variable will be uh, time, which I also denote by x naught. 
Then the Higgs field, for example, will be a, a function of three variables now, again given by a complex variant function. And the one form A, that was the electromagnetic field, uh, is replaced by, the, by this form. This is script A. This is the same in the two-dimensional interstatic case. But now we add this uh, uh, one more uh, component, which depends on uh, dt, on differential of time. All coefficients, of course, now depend on three variables. Uh, let me denote this, this special term by a super zero, which is a sub zero dt. Uh, this is the time component of our form script a. And by a straight a, this is just what was before. This is just a space component. Uh, the potential energy of our system is given by the same formula. Only now the coefficients depend on solved time. So this is the same. Uh, but now we have kinetic energy because we have time. And kinetic energy is equal to the following. This is the sum of uh, 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 components of uh, curvature, which has a time derivative. And this is a new term given here, uh, which uh, appears because of the, of the time. The described dynamical model is governed, uh, as usual in, in, in mechanics and physics, by ginzburg landau action function. This is written as usual as the integral uh, with respect to time of the what is called Lagrange function. Lagrange function is the difference between kinetic energy and uh, potential energy. And other Lagrange equations for this functional, called otherwise ginzburg landau equations, will have the following form. Uh, not simple, as you can see. I just explained uh, just a little bit about them. So there are four equations, because here are two equations. Uh, the first of, uh, here are usual notations. This is uh, covariant deri uh, derivative. Uh, and uh, these epsilons are uh, anti-symmetric tensors, as, as usual. Uh, so the first term is a special character. This is constraint type uh, equation. What does it mean? If you impose this condition at the initial moment of time, it will be fulfilled uh, for all times. And uh, uh, the last term, probably most interesting. Here you see this is uh, just covariant de Lambertian, covariant de Lambertian, and here is some cubic, uh, cubic term. So uh, this is kind of a wave operator, uh, wave operator. So it's kind of nonlinear wave equation. That's I already said. Uh, uh, note that the Ginzburg-Landau equations, as well as the action, uh, are invariant under dynamical gauge transform, which are given by the same formula as in the static case, but now chi is a smooth real value function of three variables. Our main goal is to describe solutions of above Ginzburg-Landau equations up to this dynamical gauge transformation. We call solutions of this equation simply dynamical solutions for brevity. Uh, in contrast with static solutions considered before. The quotient of the space of dynamical solutions model gauge transforms is called, as before, the moderate space of dynamical solutions. And now, how to solve these equations? These equations, uh, not like in static case where we had this Taupe's theorem, here is much more, uh, much more difficult. So in fact, we cannot uh, describe all solutions. We can give only some approximate, approximate description. Uh, so for the analysis of dynamical solutions, it is convenient to describe gauge function chi. You remember this uh, uh, participating gauge transform. So that the time component of potential vanishes. So this a sub 0 is equal 0. So we kill one term in our uh, equations. Such a choice uh, of chi is called temporal gauge. Note that after we have imposed this condition on the gauge function chi, we, we are still left with gauge freedom with respect to static gauge transforms, which do not touch, uh, do not interfere with time. Uh, in temporal gauge, uh, a dynamical solution of ginzburg landau equations may be considered as a trajectory of this form. So for any t, we have this uh, a of t, phi of t in square brackets. Whereas scale brackets of A5 denotes the gauge class of the, of the pair with respect to static gauge transformations. This trajectory, in fact, lies in, in configuration space, ND. What is that? This is uh, pairs of A5 with uh, finite uh, potential energy and vortex number D, uh, uh, which is, of course, does not depend on T because it's a topological invariant. Model static gauge transforms, which contains, in particular, the modular space of D vortices. So uh, 
we can think of that, of this ND, as kind of a uh, canyon. So the bottom of this canyon is the space of uh, static solutions. I, I recall that that was CD. Topologically, that's a CD. And uh, this may be infinite dimensional. Nobody said to us that this is finite dimensional. And what is the, uh, what is the, uh, uh, this uh, trajectory? You can think of this trajectory as a, a trajectory of some small ball. which is uh, rolling, rolling uh, 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 along the walls of this canyon. So the bottom, as I said, is MD, that is written, and this uh, said uh, about this trajectory. So this, uh, uh, this gamma is a small ball. This ball, uh, of course, can uh, also can hit the, the bottom. But it cannot stay there because it has non-trivial, uh, non-zero non, non potential uh, uh, kinetic energy. So it should uh, ascend again this, the walls of this. So this is how it looks like. Again, as I said, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the walls may be infinite dimension. Oh, yeah, that is a mistake. Sorry, thank you very much. This was just a, mis a mistake. <laughs> so, uh, suppose now uh, that uh, kinetic energy of this trajectory is, uh, is given by this. This is the definition of what is uh, kinetic uh, energy of the trajectory. And suppose that this is proportional to epsilon. Uh, gamma now depends of an, an, on epsilon, and epsilon goes to zero. We want to give the description of the solutions. Uh, then in the limit when epsilon goes to zero, that means that kinetic energy becomes uh, uh, lower and lower. And if we hit this, if we come to the, to the bottom, here this way we will be just one point because it will be static solution, just, just one, one point here. Nothing interesting. Uh, so we cannot, uh, we cannot draw anything from this description. However, what we are given, this is the main point. This is the main point. So this, suppose that this is gamma, gamma epsilon. Uh, we introduce uh, tau epsilon, which is epsilon t. And uh, we call it, so every uh, trajectory has now its own time. Uh, we, we call it uh, slow time. Uh, why it is important? Because uh, you can see uh, the, uh, the ball is, uh, is moving slower and slower, but the time also is uh, changing very slow. That means every time we will have some, some uh, line here. So in the, in the, at the end, we will have here gamma zero. So this, the limit will be not a point, but uh, some, uh, uh, some line uh, living in this uh, sp space of static solutions. This de described uh, procedure is called adiabatic limit. And in this limit, the original dynamical equations reduced to adiabatic equations whose solutions are called adiabatic trajectories. So these are adiabatic trajectories. And now comes uh, 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 the, the theorem. Why, why it is interesting? Why it is interesting to consider this? The idea uh, may look some, somewhat uh, strange. We want to describe dynamic solutions in terms of static solutions, how it's possible. Though it's possible. Uh, so first, let me describe what are this, uh, what what are these uh, generated plans, the adiabatic trajectories? Uh, they have the following intrinsic description in terms only of this MD. Uh, kinetic energy functional generates a Riemannian metric on the space MD, which is called kinetic or T metric. And the adiabatic trajectories, gamma, are geodesics of this metric. This is the main point. Why? Uh, first of all, the idea of approximate description of slow dynamical solutions in terms of the moderate space of static solution which looks a little bit strange, uh, was proposed on a heuristic level by the physicist Menton, who postulated the following adiabatic principle. For any geodesic tra trajectory gamma zero in the moderate space of uh, d vortices, 
There exists a sequence gamma epsilon of dynamical solutions converging to gamma zero in the adiabatic limit. Of course, you can understand, you understand that this is, this is sitting here. So it's not, it's not a dynamical solution. It's, a, it's impossible because every point is a static solution. So it cannot be a solution to dynamic equations. But in, a small, in some small neighborhood, it describes the solutions which are moving very slowly. So, so it gives a, a description of slowly moving dynamical solutions. And this is the main point. And uh, 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 this uh, Menton, uh, he proposed uh, the idea about the principle that any such, uh, such that is a limit of some uh, slow, slowly moving solutions. So the, uh, of course, that was a heuristic level and a rigorous mathematical formulation and the proof of this principle were given by my student, uh, Roman Palveda. Uh, so as I said, the diabetic principle uh, reduces the problem of description of the scattering of vortices in our model to the description of geodesics in the modular space of D vortices MD uh, in the kinetic metric. That is to the solution of Euler geodesic equation on the space MD provided with T metric. So you can understand the Euler equation is much simpler because it's an ordinary differential equation. Unfortunately, apart from the case D equal two, no explicit formulas for, for the T metric are known. And that's the, that's the problem. Uh, we know that this is a simple equation, but we don't know the metric. The reason is that the Taubes theorem, which describes the static solutions, itself does not provide any explicit formula for the vortex solution, with zero in prescribed po points of the complex uh, plane. Even one vortex we cannot describe. There is no formula for uh, explicit formula for one. Uh, this theorem only states the existence of such vortex in a neighborhood of the linearized solution with given zeros. That's what, why I said that this is not trivial theorem. It uh, really uh, gives no formulas. Uh, now, uh, uh, how much time I have? Uh, I have some time. So uh, now I should switch to the four-dimensional case. So as I said, I started with two-dimensional case, then we went to three-dimensional case, and now I will go to four-dimensional case. Unfortunately, here I need some notions from spinner geometry. I, of course, I, I will form formulate uh, them, but uh, I will not give precise uh, de definitions. So the Ginzburg-Landau equations, as we shall see, are closely related to the so-called Zeiberg-Witten equations which was one of the main attractions in the topology of smooth four-dimensional manifolds in last years. Zeiberg-Witten equations, as well as Young-Mills equations, are the limiting case of a more general supersymmetric Young-Mills theory. However, opposite to conformally invariant Young-Mills equations, Zeiberg-Witten equations are not invariant under the change of scale. So if you want to draw some useful information for the, these equations, uh, we have to introduce a scale parameter lambda and uh, take the adiabatic limit lambda. So here also uh, we will use the adiabatic limit method. So now uh, precise formulations. Let xg be a compact oriented Riemannian four manifold, which is provided with a standard levi civita or Riemannian connection. Then we can define the Clifford multiplication rho by differential forms on x. That is a representation of such forms by linear endomorphisms acting on smooth sections of the spinner bundle. This is a spinner bundle. This is a complex Hermitian vector bundle of rank yeah. four, which is decomposed into the direct sum of two uh, semi-spinner bundles, which have uh, rank two. So this is the first step. The second step, the second ingredient, that the spinner bundle may be, uh, so this is a bundle over our manifold X. It may be provided with a spinner connection nabla, which is the extension of levi civita connection which is a connection on X to W. Having this, we can introduce the Dirac operator, which is the main operator in, uh, in our uh, investigations. This is the composition of this uh, uh, spinner connection, uh, covariant, uh, vari uh, uh, variant of the spinner connection, multiplied with, uh, composed with the uh, Clifford multiplication. So this is a, a mapping from W plus one spinner bundle to the sections of the another spinner bundle. Uh, if the manifold XJ was symplectic, that is provided with symplectic form omega, which is compatible with G, it also has an almost complex structure J, which is compatible both with omega and G. Uh, moreover, in this symplectic case, we have a canonical construction of the spinner bundle W, uh, which uh, makes it easier all computations. 
So canonical, uh, canonical spin-torque bundle is just the bundle of zero Q forms. There are only three such sub-bundles. According to W plus is uh, uh, the sum with this uh, even Qs, and this is the only bundle with uh, type zero one. In this case, we also have a canonical spin uh, connection, double canonical, but I will not give the formula because it will take some time. Some time. And an explicit formula for the Clifford multiplication. Also, I will not do this, but this is very explicit. Moreover, if we have any Hermitian line bundle E over X of, on the same manifold X with Hermitian connection B on it, we can always construct an associated spinner bundle, which I denote by WE, which is W canonical uh, tensor multiplied with this E, and a spinner connection number A where A is a tensor product of the canonical spinner connection and the given emission connection B. In fact, uh, zeibert witnick uh, theory depends essentially only on the complex line bundle E provided with emission connection B. So uh, you can consider this, uh, this uh, theory as a billion one. And this is extremely important because uh, Young Mills uh, theory, of course, is not a billion, not in any sense a billion. And this is a billion. That makes it easier to make many computations. Uh, and that's why it was uh, a lot of enthusiasm about this uh, theory. Uh, the Dirac operator in this symplectic case is also very simple. It's just uh, the sum of d bar b uh, operator plus d bar b star, where this is L2 adjoint. Uh, introduce now the zeiberg witten action functional which looks almost the same as this uh, Ginsburg-Landau uh, uh, function. Here is modulus fa squared. Here is nabla a phi squared. That's similar to that. And this term has a new meaning, because here we have uh, some uh, uh, term which is uh, scalar curvature, like x, xj. And the local minimum of this functional satisfies the zeiberg witten equations. Here you see, very similar to what we had in the in, uh, case uh, two, uh, dimension two. Here is covariant uh, Dirac equations. And in dimension four, this is a natural operator, not d bar, but the Dirac operator is a natural operator. And here is FA plus is the cell dual component of the curvature. Uh, phi uh, was a section of W plus. So this is a two component vector. This is two component vector. And this is a two by two matrix. So you see that uh, sorry. Uh, solutions of these equations are given by pairs A phi, which uh, as, are sections of the same spinner bundle W plus. And we, uh, now, uh, we now write them as a, 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 just a section of the bundle, of this linear line bundle E, which we denote by phi naught. And phi 2 is the section of uh, uh, 0 2 form uh, with values in E. And now I come uh, to the adiabatic limit. Uh, there are some conditions. We should impose some condition on the churn class of this uh, line bundle, which I will not discuss. And we also consider some perturbation of these equations given by plugging an appropriate self dual to form eta into the second equation. Because otherwise, we cannot guarantee that there is a solution. And as I said, we consider now the case of uh, symplectic manifold, complex symplectic manifold. In this case, this complexified uh, bundle of uh, cell dual form uh, splits into three terms. This is the main term. Uh, these are uh, 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 forms which are parallel to this symplectic form omega. Here are two zero forms, and here are zero two forms. Accordingly, the second uh, uh, zeiberg witten equation uh, decomposes into the sum of three uh, uh, equations, one parallel to omega, uh, one for zero two uh, component, and to zero component, which is conjugate to zero two, which is so I, I, I meet it. Here are the equations. Here, as you can I recognize, this is Dirac equation, covariant Dirac equation. This is equation for zero two uh, uh, curvature. And this is equation for uh, uh, curvature uh, terms parallel to omega. As I said, in order to take the adiabatic limit in this equation, we should introduce into them the scale parameter and plug the perturbation form eta which is given, this is not important, this is important term. Uh, so this, uh, we, we take omega and multiply it with lambda. Uh, 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 then in terms of renormalized sections, we have this uh, equations. I will not comment on that. 
uh, uh, and I come to the, to the end of my talk. Uh, and according to Taub's, the solutions of this equation have the following behavior. Modulus of alpha lambda, this is one parameter, uh, tends to one everywhere else outside the zeros. And the second term goes to zeros uh, uh, along with first derivatives. Now denote by C lambda the zero set of this alpha lambda. These are complex curves because we are in the four dimensional case. And they converge in a very, very weak sense, unfortunately, in the sense of currents, to some pseudo glomeric divisor, which is a chain of the form, the sum of uh, different curves with uh, some multiplicities. Uh, and uh, now I, I, I'm almost finished. Sorry, I a little bit late. So, but I want to, to, to draw some picture. I think it will be interesting. It will be one of my points. So, uh, simultaneously, the original uh, Zeidler-Witten equations reduce in this adiabatic limit to the family of vortex equations in the complex plane normal to the curve CK. So we have this curves, CK. This is complex curves. And, and the normal curves are of dimension, complex dimension one. And our original equations are the four-dimensional case. They reduce to a family of vortex equations in this normal planes. Uh, so this chain uh, may be considered as a complex analog of adiabatic uh, geodesics in two plus one dimensional case. But now these geodesics are complex geodesics. Conversely, in order to reconstruct the solution of the equation from this family of vortex uh, solutions in normal place, it sh they should satisfy some nonlinear debar equation, this uh, families, which may be considered as a complex analog of Euler equations for the adiabatic uh, geodesics with complex time. And this is the last term. So we have for zeidler witten equation the following uh, correspondence. Solutions of this equation, they correspond to families of vortex solutions in normal place of pseudo-galomorphic divisors. Thank you very much. And sorry for taking you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I have a question concerning your Lagrangian that you that you have erased, unfortunately. Just, just erased. <laughs> you, <Inside. laughs> yeah, yeah, because I, I believe that the presence of the external magnetic field is very important here. Of course. Uh, because it stabilizes the abricose of vertices, but I don't see any trace of this external field in your Lagrangian. Possibly, I, I can imagine that uh, this connection is uh, due to the fact that uh, the A, your vector potential, it generates some electromagnetic field, which is uh, uh, at infinity coincides with you, but there should be some extra condition that you didn't mention. Yeah. Uh, so w w where is H here in your Lagrangian? So this is my question. Traces of H. Traces, traces of H. Tra 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 of H, yes. And I consider, you should understand that I don't consider the, 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 the full uh, 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 the full Euler Lagrange equation. I consider only minima. And minima is a, a equation for minima is first order, but the, the general uh, solution is uh, for equations of second order. And then you will have there. Uh, and I, I, also, I also do not consider here the three dimensional case. This is the only section by two. So in fact, I assume that H is homogeneous. So it doesn't change when you move this. Yeah, but uh, once uh, your solution is is invariant on the translation yes. aspect, the, the, there will be, yes. yeah, of That's course, the Lagrangian will, will not uh, yeah, cease. Yeah, otherwise that? we cannot compute anything. So we as no, human, no. sorry, I didn't say that, but this is more for physicists, maybe important for mathematicians, maybe not. Other questions? Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much.